Okay, I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that uh, over this pandemic, uh, over COVID-19, that we have been living under a bit of a cloud uh, for the last year or so. Isn't that right? Things have been pretty tough uh, for us. Things have been hard for the church. We've been living under a bit of a cloud. Fair? I think so, yes. What's that old saying? Every cloud has a silver lining. So I do wonder if it is this, that due to the restrictions, many more churches have been putting their worship services up online, and it would appear that some previously unchurched people have been dipping into these services to see if the church has got anything at all to say in a time like this. Could that be, do you think? Could that be the beautiful silver lining for this? I mean, it's the anecdotal evidence, isn't it? I mean, I know that some of the statistics thrown about are probably a little bit overblown, and we have no way of really knowing what's happening out there. But it does seem as though some people who might not dare to darken the door physically of a church, that they actually are going online to hear the good news of God. Well, if anything, we should not be a people who let opportunities pass us by. Isn't that right? So this morning, I guess, what I want us to do is something a little bit different, a little bit unusual this morning. Because yes, in this uh, sermon today, (coughs) excuse me, there is material for the people of God. Okay, so yes, there is application for the Christian, but (coughs) in the main, what I want to do this morning is to speak to you, the person either in the room, young or old, or the person at home or watching on YouTube later on, to speak to you, the unbelieving person, the person who does not yet have a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ to speak to you. And this morning, what I want us to do is to consider a story that you might actually know really well. Certainly a story that I've looked at with, you know, my previous congregation in London and with the children and so forth. And I want you to understand, if you're not a Christian, that this is a story that will this morning confront you with where you are spiritually. So if you're not a Christian, you will be in the story confronted by God with, with really your predicament before Him. But also it's, it's an amazing story because it is a story that shows you this morning the way that you can be healed, the way that you can be cleansed, the way that God works in His gospel in Jesus Christ. So, 2 Kings chapter 5. Now, you by now know what I'm going to say. I'm going to ask you if you can turn to 2 Kings 5 and to have that in front of you and to make sure even that some of the younger people in the room and at home, we've got no way of knowing if the people at home jump up and get their, their Bibles, do we? But I'm sure we can trust you that you've done that. Run across the room to get them and to make sure that the kids can see this. Okay, as we consider, first of all, A cause for concern. That's the first thing, 2 Kings 5, that I want you to think about. A cause for concern. Okay, Uh, let me ask you this. Do you have people in your life who seem to have it all? Do you have uh, people in your life that seem to have everything? Do you know the sort of people that I'm talking about? So the people who are not just really good looking, but the people who are also incredibly smart as well. Maybe even the boys and girls can think about it. Some of your classmates, some of them seem really smart and they're also funny and they can also play football and maybe, or dancing or whatever it might be. Do we know people like this? People who seem to have it all, seem to have everything. We do and they make us sick, don't they? Well, I think it's true that as we begin chapter 5, of 2 Kings here, it could seem to us that this guy Naaman is one of those people, because just look at verse 1 with me. Now stick with verse 1 with me. What do we notice? First of all, do you notice his status? 
So he is introduced to you as the commander of the army of the king. Okay, so this is a role in the ancient world that was akin to being the prime minister, right? Or the commander, uh, commander in chief. So you get the idea. Who's Naaman? He's the big cheese. You know, he's the main guy as Naaman. But read on. Do you notice that Naaman is also successful? Do you see that? See, read it. We're also told, like, oh, he's highly regarded by the king. Why, though? Because under God's oversight, he has won victories for Aram or Syria. So you with me? So he's got status, this, this chap. Status, but he's also successful. And then, <coughs> excuse me, don't you love that description in verse 1? Nobody has ever said this of me, but I would love it to be said. It depends what your translation is. But do you see it? Naaman was a, is a mighty man of valor. Come on, men, we'd like that said of us, right? A might, mighty man of valor. That sounds brilliant. But you get the idea, do you? In all seriousness, this guy is not just powerful and successful. He seems to have the character to back it up. He's brave and he's courageous with it. He's basically a colossus of a guy. Now, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? If we left it there, I think we're, we're all thinking, this, this, this guy's amazing. This guy is the business. He's got it all. But it's at this point, what happens is a little phrase jumps out of the text and grabs you by the scruff of the neck because look at the end of verse one. Do you see? Look at it. Oh yeah, we're thinking you've got everything, Naaman. You've got everything. Status, the works. And then we read, but he was a leper. Do you agree with me? That changes absolutely everything, doesn't it? Like now, when we're thinking about Naaman, what do we see? Now, suddenly, all, all, all of a sudden, we realize this is actually a guy who is really struggling with an incredibly serious disease. Now, wait, it's not necessarily leprosy as we think about it, is it? It's not necessarily Hansen's disease, but you've you got to appreciate it. It's an incredibly, incre incredibly devastating skin complaint, skin disease, mostly, most likely rather, something that's eating away at him. Do you appreciate that? Something that is destroying this man, something that, of course, renders him unclean in the eyes of the people of Israel. What different picture we've got now, don't we? Like, despite his status, despite all of its success, here's the guy who's actually sick. And I want you to appreciate it. He's sick and he's miserable with it, isn't he? Isn't he miserable? Like, he's so discontent that in this story, he is going to travel far and wide to try and get help. Who's that? That's Naaman. Now, let me, yeah, let me do what I promised to do at the start of this sermon. And let me speak to you, young or old, but the person who is not in Christ, not born again. And the first thing that I would ask you this morning is whether you can recognize a parallel that would exist between your life and what we've just noticed about Naaman. Is that true? Can you think about that? Can you analyze your life for a moment? Despite maybe the successes that you have got, you know, despite the, the favor that people have for you, despite maybe, you know, the material successes of your life, and maybe your career's going well and your relationships are going well, despite all that, does there seem to be a blight on your life? Something that just seems to constantly make you miserable, that gives you no rest, that gives you no peace at all. Does that sound f familiar to you? Well, in 2 Kings chapter 5, it's an amazing reality, think about it. God is actually showing you this morning what that is. Because even if you're not a Christian, I reckon you know this, do you? That the Bible is full of lepers, instances where lepers are healed. Do we know that? Even if you're not brought up in the church. You're like, Old Testament, look, look, lepers being healed. What about the New Testament? Maybe we can remember back to Sunday school, is that right? And lepers being healed, people with skin diseases being healed. Now, is, have we ever stopped 
to think about why is that? Like, why is the Bible so often full of instances of lepers and people's skin diseases being healed? I wonder if you can see the answer, friends. It's because these terrible skin complaints, they mirror well the situation of the human heart. These terrible skin complaints, they mirror for us, they parallel for us the spiritual illness that affects all of mankind, all of humanity. And so I ask you, now do you see the root of the problem? Why is it you're so ill at ease? Why is it that despite money, despite popularity, despite relationships, why can you not get any peace, any rest? Because all of us are sick. That because of our rebellion against God, we have a spiritual disease. And what does sin do? Do you see the parallel? What does sin do? It eats away at us, doesn't it? Sin, like these skin diseases, like leprosy, it destroys us. Ultimately, what's the most important reality, like leprosy? What happens because of sin? It renders us unclean in the eyes of God. Do you see it? Do you see the cause for concern? This morning, as you look into 2 Kings 5, do you see yourself in Naaman? Actually, if so, there's hope because that might be the first step towards the cleansing of God. So we see a cause for concern. Follow me though. Secondly, let's think about a quest for cure. Okay, a quest for cure. Now, if you know this passage well, I'm sure you probably do, or even if you just followed the reading this morning, maybe you picked up on a big contrast that God lays up for us in this text. Did you pick up on the contrast? Maybe even some of the younger people did. Think about who we've just been talking about. Naaman. So what's Naaman like? If you were to meet him, Naaman's massive. Naaman's a burly brute of a warrior, isn't he? He's intimidating, strong, not the sort of guy we want to meet walking down a dark alleyway in Dundee, right? You've got Naaman, big guy, big intimidating guy. Look with me into verse two, though. Who is it you meet next? Do you see? It's a wee lassie, just a, a young, just a young, weak Israelite girl, and her weakness could not be any more, you know, stressed to you. She's somebody who's been taken captive, and she's working as a servant to Naaman's wife. You all pick it up, you know, don't you? This contrast is chalk and cheese, Naaman, and this wee girl. Now, if we had longer, what we could do there is show, I think, how this little girl, she represents the task for St. Peter's Free Church in Dundee. Now, do you see that? Surely the Christians do. In her weakness and how feeble she is in our time of exile, just now, what is our job? We are to do as this little lassie does, aren't we? You know, we appear to be really, really weak. We are to do as she does. We are to point the afflicted to where it is that they can get healing where they can get help. If we had longer, we could point that out and open that out, but we don't. So what I actually want you to see, something ever so important in this text, and that is the mistake or the error that Naaman makes. So I want you to follow me in the text. Will you do that, please? So first place to look is to verse three. Okay, so if we could all look there at verse three. So my question that I want you to answer, where does this little lassie tell Naaman to go? Do you see it? So she says, you look, you look if he wants cleansing, if he wants to be healed, he's got to go to the prophet, right? You got that? Verse three. Next place to look is verse five to see, in a sense, the error. Where is it that Naaman actually goes? He goes to the king. Do you see it? And there's no word of going then on to the prophet. Did you see? Do you follow the mistake here? So the girl saying, oh, he needs to go to the man of God. And yet he goes to the man of state. So she's saying, 
He needs for cleansing to go to the man who represents the power of the Almighty, and he's going to the man who represents the power of, of the world. <laughs> Again, I think we could, the Christians in the room and at home, do you know, we could emph- emphasize how, how heartbreakingly familiar that reality seems to us in our evangelism. How often in our lives have we pointed people to Christ, to the man of God, only to see our loved ones decide, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere else. I'm not going to them. I'm going somewhere else. It's so familiar. But you know what I have to do this morning. I have to speak to the unbelieving person, young or not so young. And I simply want to ask you here, where are you right now looking for healing in your life? Please think about that with me. If you're not born again, where are you going right now, this season of your life, where are you looking for help and cleansing and wholeness, for salvation, for hope? I mean, come on. I think if you're honest with yourself, if you're not a Christian, you can see that all is not right between you and God. If you're not a Christian, you recognize surely there's a spiritual sickness. So what do you do in your life just now? Where are you looking? Are you doing actually maybe what Naaman does here and looking first to the world for your hope and for healing? Analyze that and think about it. You look into the world for answers, for salvation. I mean, you're doing what so many people do and look into sort of just material things. Isn't that what our world loves to do? You know, our world buys into this, this lie, doesn't it? That if we just buy that next thing, if we just get the house sorted out, if we just get a car, I'm going to be whole and I'm going to be happy. Or maybe it's not that with you. Maybe it's if I just get that relationship, I'm going to be happy. Or maybe even sexual identity. Is that what it is? You know, this idea, if I'm just accepted, if I just get to live in the way that I want to live, I just get to do what I want to do, then I will be made well and I will be happy. Well, if that in any way resonates with you, I long for you to hear the response of the king in verse 7. Because Naaman, miserable, goes to the world looking for healing. What does the king have to say? He says, am I God to kill and make alive? And he tears his robes. Do you see it? The world has to cry out of its utter and complete inability. The world cannot provide you with cleansing today. And in light of that, and if you hear anything at all, from this sermon. You must hear this. It's only if you do as Naaman eventually does and you go to the man of God, you go to Jesus Christ, it's only in him that you can be made well. So a cause for concern, right? We got that. It's quest for cure. Third thing is a contempt, a real contempt for means. So you're following through the story with me this morning. We've seen Naaman and his illness go to this king, goes to the king of Israel, finds no help. And as we read on, as we chart it through and follow through this, we see him at this stage eventually arrive at Elisha's house. Do you love the idea of that? I love it. As I've been studying it, I just love that idea (laughs) of this scene. Can you picture it, friends, of Naaman right, with all of his entourage, (laughs) with, you know, chariots galore and all these horses and gold and gifts, and they all pull up outside this, you know, lowly prophet's front door. I love it. Now, although Naaman arrives expecting a cleansing, expecting to be healed, it is the case, isn't it, that the cleansing is actually far from straightforward, Would you agree with that? That in actual fact, Naaman and Elisha kind of, what would you say? They don't get off to a great start, do they? 
They're kind of bang heads a little bit. And Naaman, at some points, would you say that Naaman is angry here? I think he is. I think he's furious. So the question that arises is what really is going on at this point? Well, this is what I want to do. And I want to ask you to follow this. I want to point you right now to two very small details in the text. And I think what these two details do is they kind of uncover Naaman's heart. Okay, so I'll point you to a couple of details and they really reveal for us what the real heart issue is for Naaman. So you'll stick with me as we do this. Okay, the the first one, have a look at verse 10 and just think about the fact that Elisha doesn't come out to Naaman. Now you noticed that when we read it, did you? That, That Elisha doesn't come out to Naaman. Don't you think that that's an amazing detail? Again, let me just speak to the the younger people, okay? Can I ask you, what would you do if this afternoon you were at home and you looked at your kitchen window or your bedroom window and (laughs) you saw a whole host of chariots and horses pull up outside you? What would you do? I think I know, I certainly know what my girls would do. They would run and get their dad and say, Dad, we have to go out and see the horses. There's horses outside, Dad. But we would, right? There's chariots and horses. First thing we're doing, we're, we're, we're finding out. And isn't it strange? That's not what Elisha does. What does he do instead? Did you, did you notice? He sends out his messenger and how does Naaman respond? Did you pick up on it? He loses his rag. Like this drives him mad. In fact, Naaman is apoplectic with rage about this. What I want you to understand is in verse 11, where Naaman says, Elisha should have come out to me. I need you to appreciate that the last two words there in verse 11 in that phrase are emphatic So it's not just, oh, he should have come out to me. This is Naaman, furious, saying, this little man, he should have come out to me. To me, I am Naaman. Now, perhaps we're already identifying what the heart issue is, are we? But to make it sure, to confirm our suspicions, there's a second detail, because I'm asking you, what did the messenger say? Do you notice the messenger says he needs to go and wash in a river? Which river? Did we get it? And the reason which river is it? It's the Jordan River. And we could maybe even hear Naaman. You know, what? The Jordan River. But I am a Syrian. I'm from Aram. We have the greatest rivers in all of the world. And you're asking me to, to wash there in that filth? I'm not going to do it. And surely it is now, at this very point, we recognize the problem with this man. Isn't that right? Don't, don't you see it? What, why is he so angry? Why such rage? What's the problem here, friends? The problem with Naaman is the problem of pride. Isn't it? He wants recognition. If he's going to be healed, he wants a Tension. He wants, oh, God, it's blazing. He wants pomp and ceremony. He is a man who just absolutely cannot stand the apparent simplicity of the way that God works. Hates it. Hates the fact this seems lowly, this seems humble, the supposed cleansing of God. Now, I think if the, I think if the focus of the sermon was ever so slightly different, I think we as Christians could empathize with each other that regardless of who you're trying to reach with the gospel just now, who we're trying to speak to about Jesus Christ, whether it is friends or family or colleagues, whoever, does that not, that contempt in 21st century Scotland, as as it stands, does that contempt for God's cleansing and God's means, does that not ring true for us as Christians? That is not the focus of this sermon. So I wonder this, If you're not a Christian, is that where you are this morning? As you think about your attitude towards biblical Christianity, is there great contempt? Contempt for Christ. I wonder if that's it. You know, is it the case that 
up until this point this morning, up to this point in your life, you've just laughed at, at the idea that cleansing is available from the blood of Jesus Christ. Is that to you, has that seemed absolutely ludicrous? Have you laughed at that notion? Or is it, wait, is it worse than that? Have you been simply angered by what you've heard from Christians and what you've heard from the, the gospel? This idea that you cannot of yourself achieve or merit or earn the favor of God. Has that led you to be angry, not just laughing, but furious at biblical Christianity? Well, even if you perhaps don't know me from Adam, I would plead with you not to let pride get in the way. I mean, I'll be frank with you. If you are to be saved, if you are to be healed, yes, you're going to have to recognize that there is incredible need in your life because of your sin. And you are going to have to bow to Jesus Christ and yield to him but I would just put it back, the ball in, back into your court and say, is it not worth it? Is it not? You know, even at this hour, to be made clean, to be made whole, is it not worth it to have your guilt taken, your shame, your sin, forever washed clean away? So don't let ego pride get in the way. Today, wash in Christ Jesus and be clean. So a cause for concern, a quest for cure, contempt for means. And the last thing this morning is this, a cleansing for outsiders. A cleansing <clears throat> for outsiders. So this was a good while ago, but I remember... Uh, sitting in a coffee shop in London. So it has to be a good while ago, right? Because we're not allowed in these places anymore. Um, so it was a good while ago, and I'm sitting with a guy who's, it was only very tentatively, loosely connected to uh, our church in London. And uh, this guy was not a, a Christian bloke, not a professing Christian, but he was kind of dipping in and out the church. And in conversation, it was, you know, I'll be honest, a bit discouraging. Um, because the issue became clear and really quite quickly. This was the guy's issue. He had way too limited an understanding of what we call rebirth, regeneration of conversion. So a massively limited view. So this is what he thought. He thought that when a person became a Christian, that ultimately what was going on there was a lifestyle change. That's what happened. A conscious decision on the part of the person to try and, I don't know, you know, turn over a new leaf pool, the person socks up. That's what it meant to become a Christian. That was it. The person makes a decision, I am going to stop doing these bad things and I'm going to attend church more. We've all heard that a million times, I'm sure. That's the change, the change that comes about. Well, I don't know about you, but one of the most striking things for me in this portion of Scripture is the dramatic extent <laughs> of the transformation that comes over this bloke, Naaman. Dramatic extent of the transformation. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you with me, and I'm going to ask you a question. Here it is. What do you think happens in the Jordan? What happens in the Jordan there? So Naaman is going over, you know, and he's, he's, he's not happy. Eventually he goes, to, and he, what happens? He gets cleansed. So do you think that his leprosy is washed away? Is that what happens? Have a look at the end of verse 14. Look at this. Yeah, his leprosy is washed away, but look at this. His flesh, and it very much depends on the translation you've got, but his flesh becomes like that of a, a, a little child or a baby or a, a, a young boy. So in a sense, do you see how dramatic this change is? He's not just, you know, washed leprosy. He's reborn in, in a sense. Then, stick with me, notice the faith. Look at verse 15. Like in verse 15, honestly, we have one of the grandest uh, professions of God in all of the Old Testament. 
in verse 15. Do you see what he says here? He says, there's no other God. There's no other God of faith. If that's not enough for you, then read on. You've got repentance in verse 17. So Naaman turns away from false worship. Do you see what I'm saying to you? The, the extent of the transformation. Now, all of that's amazing. But best of the lot, the thing that grabs me the most, surely for you too, is the new heart that this guy receives. Because hang on a minute, people. What did we just say about Naaman? Can you remember? What was he like? He was, what was the word? What was his problem? Pride. I mean, this guy was a fool. I mean, excuse me, but it's true, isn't it? I mean, a proud man, egotistical, self-centered. The pride was disgusting a moment ago. And I wonder if you noticed this. After his cleansing, in the space of three short verses, Naaman refers to himself as a servant five different times. Isn't that amazing? A minute ago, this horrible guy, I mean, just proud, self-seeking, wanting all the attention. God's hand goes on him, and suddenly there's meekness. I am your servant. You know, he's gentle, he's lowly, he's mild. Now, that is lovely, it is mind blowing. But isn't it all the more startling when you remember who he is? Who is this guy? He is Naaman the what? Naaman the Syrian. Isn't that staggering? Do you see? This is a divine work of grace that comes to an outsider. This comes to somebody who is not part of the covenant community, not part of Israel. This is grace. This is healing. This is salvation for an enemy of God. And because of that, I want to end the sermon like this by asking you sincerely, if you are an unbelieving person, if that is how you have regarded yourself when it comes to spiritual things, do you regard yourself? Have you regarded yourself as an outsider, an outsider when it comes to the church, an outsider when it comes to Christian things that the gospel can't be for you because you don't regard yourself like, as, like me or like the people in this room. And you're maybe thinking, oh, if these people in this church, if they knew what I was really like or what I was doing last night even, or what I've been doing this week, there's no way they would think the gospel is for me. Do you think like that? Do you think you are an outsider? Well, surely, surely you get it. Surely you see in Naaman, the Syrian, what God is showing you this morning. He has shown you clearly in 2 Kings 5 that there is cleansing and salvation that you can have. That through the offense of the cross, through the righteousness that Christ has earned, secured through his sin-bearing death, believe me when I say, this hour you can be made clean. You can be healed. Friend, I really have to ask you, don't you want that? Don't you want to be right in the sight of God? Well, then what on earth can you be waiting for? This morning, come to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith and like Naaman, the Syrian, be made clean, be made whole and all by the mercy and the grace of God. Friends, let's bow our heads. And let's pray.